Hi, this is Nathan Fletcher. I am making a proposal on testing the sanction effectiveness in relation to state fragility. Um, for the introduction, we're looking at sort of fictitious countries, non-state actors, and the international order, and sort of tying those all in. So we have a background, we go into the lit review revolving sanctions. To start, we're looking at non-state actors. Non-state actors are sort of loosely defined as any organization not affiliated with the government. Um, this includes businesses, nonprofits, and more. However, in the context of foreign policy, the literature referring to non state actors generally is referring to revolutionaries, insurgents, freedom fighters, and terrorists. Moving from there to fictitious countries, we're going to look at fragile and, state, and failed states, excuse me. And these are states that lack effective control over their sovereign territory and the population within that territory. Fictitious states are defined as a subset of these categories that differs in that these nations were never historically ruled by one polity. The literature uh, sort of reveals that um, violent non-state actors thrive in these nations as they generally experience extreme regime disempowerment and inability to properly enforce law throughout the extent of their territory. However, the current state-centric model that international law uses makes it hard to hold non-state actors within fictitious states accountable because it assumes that the host countries bear ultimate responsibilities for their actions. That brings us to the international order. The current international order is based in a state-centric model. The charters of international institutions like the UN are written in a manner meant to deal with state-to-state -state interactions, which makes it really difficult to address the idea of non-state actors operating from within fictitious countries and severely diminishes the clarity with which use of force can be applied. When a country fails to control the non-state actors within its borders and they commit international crimes, terrorism being the most common in the literature, it becomes much more complicated for international organizations to effectively allow for peacekeeping troops to step in like they would in a conflict with developed nations. As a side note, the UN struggles even under the best of circumstances to hold crimes accountable through force, uh, even when they are state-to-state -state issues, because the world is really just not as black and white as the Charter would have them believe. For example, in 2014, Russia justified its expansion into eastern Ukraine, which was illegal, under the guise of territorial reclamation, which is technically a state issue, and as such, there was no binding resolution passed from the UN or any uh, peacekeeping troops sent to enforce law. This inability to exercise use of force on fictitious countries to hold violent non-state actors accountable leads into the current use of economic sanctions as a means of getting nations to fold uh, to international pressure. This leads us into examining the current literature on sanctions and fictitious states. So when we look at our literature review, we want to examine what do we know and what do we not know. Reviewing the sanctions uh, literature, looking at effectiveness, we know that there's a lot of literature discussing the conditions requisite to sanction effectiveness. We know that the most effective types of sanctions have proven to be import sanctions as compared to uh, financial or export sanctions and then full embargoes, which are sort of a combination. Within those categories, we want to know when are they most effective, what contributes to that. And we know that um, they are most effective, generally, when the sending country has a substantial market share in the target country. The target is democratic. The target lacks third-party substitutes to replace trade loss. The issues are highly salient. Um, the sanctions have a wide economic impact. They're not niche. There is a, an international institution backing the sanction. And there are not al it's not al already highly saturated country, not a large number of sanctions already imposed on the target. There's lots more, but those are some of the ones that come up a lot in the literature. Moving from there, we know that the literature is lacking in some substantive substantive areas, excuse me. We know there's no substantial research connecting sanctions to fictitious, failing, or fragile nations. And moreover, all the literature is from the perspective of a state-centric worldview, which limits its current applicability when considering fictitious countries. My research question here is, does a target country's fragile state index, we'll get into that in a moment, ref rank reflect how effective sanctions are at producing policy change? Uh, my independent variable is target country fragile state index rank, and my dependent variable is sanction success rates, and those are going to come from the global sanction database. Methodology, this is purely quantitative study using secondary data from the fragile state, states index and the global sanctions database. The FSI ranks countries in a mixed methods manner according to the state stability, political upheaval, violence, and quite a few other factors. The GSDB has categorized over a thousand sanctions since 1950 and assigns to them ordinal categories of success between total failure and total success or ongoing. Sampling will exclude sanctions prior to 2010 to create a relevant and current sample. GSDB sanctions between 2010 and 2020 will serve as the eligible population for the study. 
from those sanctions, sanctions classified as ongoing by the GSDB will be excluded um, just because they're not really analyzing success at this moment. From there, eligible sanctions will be coded with their target country's FSI rank at the time of sanction conclusion and their success classifications will be coded between one and four. Now, this is a question for you, Dr. Belliard, since I'm recording this, I'm not 100% sure how to list a sample population because I'm literally going to, I'm proposing we include all the sanctions that fit this criteria. It'll be well over 100 and it will get us below that point nine, the 95% confidence inter interval. But that's just a question for you if you happen to have a problem with how I've laid it out because I don't explicitly list it because I'm planning on using all non-excluded. Continuing that, um, we're going to do statistical analysis, statistical analysis, uh, specific, co specifically correlational because both, uh, Variables are ordinal, uh, they use ordinal le levels of measurement. Um, we need to use Spearman's row, which is sort of limiting because we can't go into inferential or pre predictive statistics. Our null hypothesis is that there will be no correlation between countries' FSI rank and sanction effectiveness. And then our research hypothesis is always obviously the opposite, and it predicts that there will be a correlation between those two factors. The limitations of this study, um, obviously robustness may be limited due to disproportionate numbers of sanctions under optimal conditions being placed upon uh, more developed countries. I haven't seen any literature referring to that. Assume, this, this assumes that sanctions can have substantive impact on non-state actors when aimed at their host countries. We don't know that for a fact because of the deficits in the literature. And this may unintentionally exclude sanctions not recorded in the GSDB. Finally, while the FSI is a well-documented respected source, it is a mixed method approach which does allow for some discretion uh, upon the country reviewers assigning rank. Communication results, obviously, this is going to be primarily intended for policymakers, so the ideal dissemination would occur in policy briefs and academic journals relating to international affairs, policy, and economics. What's next after this study? Um, primary data collection is always going to be the goal here. And so it's clear that having exclusively secondary data present is not ideal, but this is a starting point. Should the data from 2010 to 2020 reveal a statistically significant relationship, the next step would be to do a longitudinal study on current sanctions over a five to 10 year period, examining the same factors, FSI rank in comparison with success rates. Conclusions, um, implications for the literature. This study is very much a starting point. Currently, there is nothing connecting fictitious states and international accountability to sanction efficacy. This provides a point of reference. Next, in the event that the null hypothesis is rejected, researchers should investigate how FSI rankings change through the duration of a sanction for the target country and if that potentially contributes to cap capitulation or, or is in, at least uh, they correlate. Research into how often sanctions applied to fictitious country meet the conditions for sanction success uh, compared to sanctions on developed countries. That'd be really great information to have. Again, there's a huge deficit um, between these two areas. And that brings us to the end. These are all the resources. Um, Finekane and Schumacher and Schrader are going to be the ones that really reference uh, fictitious states and non-state violence. And all the rest are sanction analysis, obviously. Um, I'm recording this so there won't be any questions, but I would love to answer any if you have them for me, um, and I'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.